This is Corky. He's in there? Corky's in here. Oh, wow. So the founder of Samum, Corky, he passed away in 2008, and he, he, he's been mummified. And he's in here. He's in a mumma form. This is bronze, and then it's covered with gold leaf. And is it his, like, his actual face? And that's his, yes. Mm -hmm. That's his life mask, his face. And eventually he's going to go into a mausoleum that we've built on the other side over there. And then <coughs> these are all mummy cats. <coughs> Some mummy dogs over there. And this is a dog that we're mummifying that somebody sent to us from, uh, uh, was it Ohio? Yeah, I think it was Ohio. No, Illinois. Illinois, I'm sorry. So, What's the dog's name? He has like two names. It's a she, Silly Nugget and Basenji. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, so he's in the process. Um, what we do on, on Wednesday evenings is we generally read from books that are similar to the Summum philosophy. And we've been reading a book called the Upanishads. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. They're, they're a Hindu, Hindu writing. Um, but usually when new people come around, we actually we read from uh, the Summum book, the Summum philosophy book. We're going to touch a little bit about the philosophy and we're going to talk about some... Uh, the principles that it's based on, and uh, and maybe have a little discussion. So we start the class. I'm going to ring this bowl and just use that as an opportunity to silence your mind for a little bit, and then we'll start. So before we start, though, um, how did you guys hear about someone? Did you hear about it through Amanda? I actually heard about it before I knew Amanda. She knew you, yeah. But um, I think it was on a website. There was like different things to see in Salt Lake. Right. And so I read. I saw that, and then I just kind of read up on it a little bit. I don't know. Whole yeah, I saw. I saw. What was it called? It was like a staycation website, what to do in Salt Lake if you don't go away on vacation, and they listed a few things, and, and we were in the list. So, anyway, um, so, have you been on our website at all? Do you know that we have a website? Yeah. So, we published a philosophy book, and, um, and we have, um, that you can download through our website. We also have a lot of stuff on the website. Um, that talks about the philosophy. We have transcripts of classes that Corky gave. We have video. Um, we teach meditation. We, uh, we make something called nectar publications that are used in meditation. It's a sacramental wine. Um, we're actually Utah's first federally bonded winery the first federally bonded winery. The first winery was something run by Brigham Young. He had a real big winery operation down in southern Utah. But, uh, um, and then we do the mummification. So, I mean, if you'd like to check it out, usually what I suggest is people go, um, you know, visit the website, go through things, and then every Wednesday evening, you know, we have these classes. You're always welcome to come. So I'm going to read a couple of chapters from the Summum book. One is called uh, The Summum Philosophy, and the other one is called uh, is The Seven Summum Principles. That gives a little bit of a, a brief discussion about all the principles. The voice of wisdom is silent except to the open mind. Summum. The Summum Philosophy embodies the principles of creation itself. 
from grand cycle to grand cycle, the fundamental esoteric teachings of the Summum Bonum are taught to select advanced souls who then progress to new spiritual levels. The last recorded reservoir of these teachings on planet Earth has been found in Egypt, a home of the pyramids. All nations have borrowed from the ancient inheritance of Egypt, India, Persia, China, Japan, ancient Greece, Rome, and other countries partook liberally at the feast of knowledge with the, which the masters of the land of Ra and Isis so freely provided for them. At the ascension of the grand cycles, the Summa individuals enlightened the souls and minds of those ready to receive the knowledge. These Summa individuals are referred to as the netters in the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. Here on planet Earth, the pyramids were used as the storage house from which knowledge stored potentially could be obtained, transmitted, and then used dynamically to catapult the select advanced souls forward in evolution. Within the pyramid sanctuaries, the student would enter, then emerge as initiate or master to travel the four corners of the earth, carrying with them the pr precious kinetic knowledge. All serious students of these principles recognize the debt they owe to these venerable masters of those ancient lands and to their teachers, the Summa individuals. Now the Summa, um, some of them started as, as a result of um, Corky having an encounter with the Summa individuals who we refer to as advanced beings. And that's what we're talking about here. And before I leave, I'll give you a little brochure that sort of talks about this, uh, where he talks about what happened to him and the some individuals and how this all came about. Even the teachings of the Gnostic and early Christians drew their roots from the Summum principles. Unfortunately, these same teachings were lost at the time of Constantine, Constantine, whose iron hand smothered philosophy with its blanket of theology. The loss to the Christian church was incalculable, for its very essence and spirit was gutted. Its participants were thrown into the abyss of the Dark Ages. The restored purity of these principles rests with the faithful souls who dedicate their lives to keep alive the message of these teachings. These teachings are not found in, any, in books to any great extent. The understanding is passed on from master to initiate, from initiate to student, from voice to open mind. Even today there will be found a few reliable books on this philosophy although there are countless references to it in various phases of science, metaphysics, religion, and philosophy. Yet the Summum Principles are the only master key which will open all doors to the knowledge of creation. These principles are formulated through nature and cannot be ascribed to a god or humankind. It is these principles which are the cause of gods and humankind, not vice versa. It is not possible to understand these principles using the intellect alone, for they must be experienced, and humankind, through its experience, must evolve to this understanding. The law of knowledge must be applied to all principles for one to have real knowledge rather than just belief. The systematic law of learning requires you to first question the principle and read the words about it. Secondly, you must take activity in the principle and experience the action, the cause and effect of the principle. Thirdly, you move to a knowledge of rather than a belief about the principle, for the principle and its workings becomes your personal knowledge through experience. For example, let us suppose you have never eaten an almond before and you would like me to convey to you the knowledge of what an almond tastes like. I can tell you that an almond tastes sweet, that it is crunchy, bitter, smooth, or dry, and describe it in other ways. You now have a description about what an almond tastes like. At this point, you still do not know what an almond tastes like because all you have is some sort of belief about what it tastes like based upon my description of it. There really is no description that can, that can convey to you what an almond tastes like. The only way you are going to know for yourself, rather than have just having a belief, is for, is for you to experience the taste of an almond through your own personal experience of eating an almond. A knowledge of the principles of summum requires you to apply the systematic law of learning 
and experience them, or they will be as mere words, words, words to you. There have been collections of maxims, axioms, aphorisms, and precepts, which are mostly not understandable to outsiders, but, but which are readily understood by the initiate once explained and exemplified by the masters. These teachings really constitute the basic principles of psychokinesis, which contrary to the general belief deals with the mastery of mental forces rather than material elements. Psychokinesis is really the alteration of one kind of mental vibration into another, a much more encompassing, varied, and dynamic process. The alteration of material forms, such as changing one kind of metal into another, is but an aspect of psychokinesis. Where is heard the voice of the master, the mind of those ready for the teaching is open, summum. When the student's mind is open, then comes the voice to fill it with wisdom, summum. According to these aphorisms, this book will attract the attention of those prepared to receive the teaching. Likewise, when the pupil is ready to receive the wisdom, then will this little book come to him or her. Such is the law. The principle of cause and effect in its aspect of the law of attraction will bring the voice and open mind together. The student and this book thus come together. Since this book has come into your hands, you are now at a point in life to be exposed to the summum philosophy. So isn't it interesting on the things you're learning at work, all the stuff you read in a book or what someone may tell you, it's a little different than when you actually go through the experiences of having to deal with that, all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's good to read about things in books or to hear what other people have to share with you, but um, until you really... Um, start having experiences with it is when you really start to understand what it's all about. And that goes for anything. Playing sports, a job, teaching. So I'm going to read a chapter called Seven Summer Principles, um, which kind of goes over each of the principles. The book gets into more in-depth about all the principles, but this just kind of goes over them, and we'll have maybe a little discussion about them. The principle of knowing creation are seven. Those who know these possess the magic key to whose touch all locked doors open to creation, summum. The seven great principles upon which the summum philosophy is based are as follows. Number one, the principle of psychokinesis. Number two, the principle of correspondence. Number three, the principle of vibration. Number four, the principle of opposition. Number five, the principle of rhythm. Number six, the principle of cause and effect. Number seven, the principle of gender. These seven great principles will be discussed and explained at length in this work. A short explanation of each, however, will be given at this point for all the principles of some of them have an interrelationship with each other. So the first principle, the principle of psychokinesis. Summum is mind, the universe is a mental creation. Summum. This first great principle embodies the idea that all is mind. It explains that summum which is the substantial essence underlying all the outward manifestations and appearances which you know under the terms of the material universe, the phenomena of life, matter, energy, space-time, distance, speed, relativity, and in short, all that is apparent to your material senses, is spirit. The spirit may be considered and thought of as a universal, infinite living mind. This living mind performs gastrulation, which is a turning of itself inside out, manifesting its esoteric nature outwardly. Therefore, all the phenomenal worlds and universes are simply a mental creation of summum, mind, subject to the laws of created things, and the universes as a whole 
and in their parts or units have their existence in the mind of Samam. It is in this mind that we live and move and have our being. This subjective observation of creation is the principle which establishes the mental nature of the universes and easily explains all of the varied mental and psychic phenomena. Without such explanation, these phenomena are not understandable and defy scientific inspection. An understanding of this first great principle of psychokinesis empowers the individual to comprehend the laws of the mental universe and to apply the same to his or her well-being and rhythmed advancement. The serious student is empowered to apply intelligently the great mental laws instead of using them in a haphazard manner. With the master key in his or her possession, the student may unlock the many doors of the mental and psychic sanctuaries of knowledge and enter the same freely and intelligently. This principle explains the nature of matter, energy, space-time, and why and how all these are subordinate to the mastery of mind. Those who understand the knowledge of the mental nature of the universe are well advanced on the path to mastery. Without this master key, mastery is impossible, and the student knocks, knocks in vain at the many doors of creation. So psychokinesis, um, <coughs> what comes to mind when you, guy, when you guys have heard the word or come across the word? Anything? Ability to kind of change things with your thoughts, I guess. Okay. Um, so, I mean, that's good. So, psychokinesis, a lot of people sort of equate psychokinesis to like moving objects with your mind, right? It's telekinesis. And uh, yeah, doing something, you know, physically with your mind. But um, the word psychokinesis is, in, is interesting because it really is, is, uh, men, it, um, sort of translates to mental action. And um, the principle of psychokinesis is saying that the underlying essence of everything is mental, is mind. And it says, some of them is mind, the universe is a mental creation. Um, the word summum is a Latin word. And if you look it up, the Latin meaning, it means the highest or the greatest. And within the summum philosophy, it means the sum total of all of creation, the sum of everything. So there really isn't anything higher or greater than that. It's the sum of everything. And um, cultures and people and everything have given that different names. You know, some people might refer to it as God. Some people might refer to it as Allah or Elohim or, you know, it's been given many different names. So here we we refer to it as summum, the sum total of everything. And, um, and it's saying the principle that the, um, the universe is a mental creation um, that is um, created with the mind of summum. And in fact, this universe and all the universes, anything you can think of and not think of, all comes out of the mind of summum. And that being the case, that means that um, mind is the underlying essence of everything. And that, so back to what you said, you know, controlling things with your mind. The first thing that we all really need to do is to be able to control our own mind with our own mind. And um, if you look at life, I mean, everything that's happening to you, happening around you or whatever, you're experiencing it because of your mind, right? If you took your mind away. But we are so, so involved in all this chaos and all the stuff going on that we um, never take time to... Um, look at what's going on with our mind and um, start ourselves on a path to where we can um, develop a 
better self-control or find a way to put ourselves in a space that we would prefer to be in rather than being caught up in uh, you know some sort of a chaos like for example you go to work and someone is having a bad day you can feel it right and it affects you you're driving down the road every morning I'm on my way to work and there's this one little stretch of traffic and it never fails that some driver will you know get to me but it really it's how I react to the situation right it's how I um, manage my ma mind, whether I'm going to choose to be um, affected by it or whether I'm not going to. And there are all sorts of uh, situations. I mean, life is constantly situations like this one after another. And we are so easily affected by things going on around us that... Um, it can make it difficult but if you start to take a little time to start um, um, looking at your mind looking at its inner workings and then what we do here is we teach people a meditation to help them to do that because it's um, you're so involved in the outside world um, you need a method to sort of start changing your attention from going out there to, to going inside so you can start to look at things, right? But um, anyway, psychokinesis is the first principle and it basically says that everything is mind. It all comes out of the mind of creation. And if you realize that the underlying essence is mind, you start to get a little different perspective on the world and everything in life and what, what it's about. Second principle, the principle of correspondence. As above, so below. As below, so above. <clears throat> Summum. This principle embodies the idea that there is always a correspondence or correlation between the laws and phenomena of the various levels of being in life. This aphorism, as above, so below. As below, so above gives one the means of solving many mysterious paradox and hidden secrets of nature. There are levels beyond your knowing, but when you apply the principle of correspondence to them, you are able to understand much that you would otherwise that would otherwise be unknowable to you. This principle exists at the various levels of the material, mental, and spiritual universes and is of universal application. This principle has been considered to be one of the most important mental instruments by which humankind is able to set aside the obstacles which hide the unknown from view. Its use can even remove the veil of Isis, death, so that one can catch a glimpse of the other side. Just as a knowledge of the principles of geometry empowers the astronomer to measure distant suns and their movements while seated in an, an observatory, a knowledge of the principle of correspondence empowers you to reason intelligently from the known to the unknown. All the principles from of excuse me, all the principles of summum have an interrelationship with correspondence. Correspondence draws its nature from the copulation of creation. Studying the monad, one is studying the universe. So everything comes from the one source and so everything sort of has a relationship and all the fundamental laws are in operation and apply to everything and what correspondence is saying is that um, if we come across something that is unknown to us we could we can take a look at something that is known to us and, and compare it and use that to um, figure out the unknown. Like, have you ever, have you ever used a comparison or an analogy to explain something to somebody? It happens all the time. How many times do we say, "Well, it's like this"? Like I just said, it's like this, or it's like like that. 
So you're constantly, I mean, with Roman. You ever explain him something saying, well, it's like this? You take something he kind of understands to, play, to explain something he doesn't understand? Mm -hmm. We do it all the time. It's a correspondence. And um, you can look around at things and you can see uh, uh, the correspondence. You can see um, like the waves in the ocean, the cycle of the waves, the cycle of the seasons, the cycle of the rhythms of our body, the cycle of our mental states. Um, there, everything is related, and, and the same things are going on. And so, with correspondence, you can take a look at things and and uh, uh, use that as a tool to understand something. I know that, like in my job, I'm in IT. We have a software used by hospitals, and the software gets pretty complex. And um, and trying to understand what it does sometimes can be a little overwhelming for people. And a lot of times I tell them it's like going to the library and checking out a book. You go to the library, you open up the book catalog, you look for the number, you find the shelf with the number, and you find your book. Well, the software is kind of like that, except it's electronically. You're using the software to find an ID, and then you take the ID and go look it up, and then you look it up and you get the information. Same thing. It's all, it's all related. Um, Chris, do you ever have people talk to you about, or you ever use correspondence at work to sort of talk to people about things? All the time. All the time, yeah. Right, because I work with the developmentally disabled and uh, a lot of autism and, and mental issues. And I, I, they mainly just want to be listened to. Um, and when you listen to them, you see, I see things in myself that they're going through. It's just a different degree. It's, it's not identical because the, these people are, there's some pretty sick kids I work with, but I can, I understand what they're saying because it's just a different degree of the same thing. And I see that in my own life and, and when they present their conflicts and arguments and complaints with me I you know I I may it helps me to be able to listen because I have the same arguments and conflicts it's just a different degree of the same thing on the scale so yeah correspondence is really useful what amazes me is like uh, you know I, I kind of like science. I like I, I read scientific stories like yeah. the things they discover in space, astronomy, and all they're using their mathematical formulas and the laws of physics and everything, and and, and they 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 figure all this stuff out. Um, what's going on in the universe, and it's just really amazing that they are able to do that. But I mean, they're just using correspondence with what they're doing. That's another example. Okay, the uh, third principle, the principle of vibration. Nothing rests, everything moves, everything vibrates. Some of them. This principle embodies the idea that everything is in motion, everything vibrates. Nothing is at rest. Facts which science endorses and which each new scientific discovery tends to verify. Yet this principle was enunciated thousands of years ago by masters of old. This principle explains that the difference between various manifestations of matter, energy, space-time, mind, and even spirit result largely from varying rates of vibration. From creation's copulation, summum, which is pure spirit, down to the grossest form of matter, all is in vibration. From the in and out of bond, infinite times in a finite moment, creation's copulation, to the expansion and collapse of the universe. The rate of vibration is observed as states of proper time. The higher the vibration, the higher the position in the scale. Vibration of spirit is at such an infinite rate of intensity and rapidity that it is seemingly at rest, just as a rapidly turning wheel seems to be motionless. At the other end of the scale, there are gross forms of matter whose vibrations are so low as to seem at rest. Between these two opposing points, there are billions upon billions of varying degrees of vibration, 
from a quark, S quark, lepton, S lepton, electron, atom, and molecule to planets and universes. Everything is in vibratory motion. This is also true in the fields of energy and force, which are but varying degrees of vibration, and also at the mental levels, whose states depend upon vibrations, and even at the spiritual levels. All the principles of summum have an interrelationship with vibration. Vibration draws its nature from the copulation of creation. An understanding of the principle with the appropriate application empowers the student to control their own mental vibrations as well as those of others. The masters also apply this principle to the conquering of natural phenomena in various ways. To those who understand the principle of vibration have taken hold of the scepter of power. So vibration is all around us. I mean we um, live in a sea of vibration. All the music you listen to, all the sounds that you hear, TV that you watch, the noises. You look in, you know, and that's, that's vibration at a, at a sound level. Anything you're looking at, you know, colors, color has a vibration, light has a vibration. Um, the way something looks, like the couch, the design of the couch. In, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of a mandala. In Hinduism, the mandala, it has a design to it. It has a vibration to it. It's used in meditation. Um, there really is nothing, like it says, n nothing is at rest, everything is vibrating. And you can take a look at your mind again. Um, your mind is vibrating. And you can, you can see the different states, like, you know, sometimes you have a high energy going on about you, and then other days you're just dragging your butt um, and it's possible to change that vibration it is possible to pull yourself out of dragging your butt and it's also possible to do the reverse your mind be in a good state and decide to make yourself miserable and then you can feel the vibrations people have right have you ever gone into a room and someone had a vibe on all right, and um, and that vibration affects you. And again, it, you know, it comes back to the essence of mind. You can, for most people, they are easily affected. Um, they are easily affected by these vibrations around them. But through um, mental exercise, you can develop a control over your mind where. Um, you're not so affected by the vibration. You rest within your own vibration and you rest into the state that you choose to be in rather than being affected by something going on about you. So anyway, just, you know, watch the world. Watch these things. You know, watch the vibration. Look at all those things. You'll, you'll see, I mean, when you get familiar with all these principles, you'll see they're everywhere. Um, the fourth principle, the principle of opposition. Everything is dual. Everything has an opposing point. Everything has its pair of opposites. Like and unlike are the same. Opposites are identical in nature, but different in degree. Extremes bond. All truths are but partial truths. All paradoxes may be reconciled. This principle embodies the idea that everything is dual. Everything has two opposing sides. Everything has its pair of opposites, of which all are ancient aphorisms. It explains the paradoxes that have perplexed so many and have been stated as follows. Thesis and antithesis are identical in nature, but different in degree. Opposites are the same, differing only in degree. The pairs of opposites may be reconciled. In and out of bond, nothing and possibility meet. Extremes bond. Everything is and is not at the same time. Every truth is partially false. All truths are a paradox. There are at least two sides to every story, etc. It explains that in everything there are two opposing points or as opposite aspects, complementarity, 
and that opposites are really only the two extremes of the same event, with many varying degrees between them. To illustrate, hot and cold, although opposites, are really the same phenomenon, the difference consisting merely of degrees of the same event. Look at your thermometer and see if you can discover where hot terminates and cold begins. In actuality, there is no such thing as absolute hot or absolute cold. The two terms hot and cold simply indicate varying degrees of the same event. And that same event which manifests as hot and cold is merely a form variety and rates of vibration. So hot and cold are simply the two opposing points of that which you call temperature, and the phenomena attendant thereupon are manifestations of the principle of opposition. The same principle is involved in the case of light and darkness, which are the same event, the difference consisting of varying degrees between the two opposing points of the phenomenon. Where does darkness leave off and light begin? What is the difference between large and small, hard and soft, black and white, sharp and dull, noise and quiet, high and low, positive and negative? The principle of opposition explains these paradoxes. The same principle operates on the spiritual and mental levels. Take an example from the mental level, that of love and hate. Two mental states apparently totally different, yet there are degrees of hate and degrees of love and a middle point in which you use the terms like or dislike, which shade into each other so gradually that sometimes you are at a loss to know whether you like or dislike or neither. All are simply degrees of the same event as you will find if you will but feel it for a moment. More than this, and considered of more importance by the students, it is possible to change the vibrations of hate to the vibrations of love in one's own mind and in the minds of others. Many of you who have read these lines have had personal experiences of the involuntary rapid transition from, from love to hate and the reverse, and in your own case and that of others. You will therefore realize the possibility of this being accomplished by the use of the will, by means of knowing the will, good and evil, are but opposing points of the same event, and the student understands the art of altering evil into good by means of an application of the principle of opposition. In short, the art of immersion becomes a phase of psychokinesis known and practiced by the ancient and modern masters. All the principles of some of them have an interrelationship with opposition. Opposition draws its nature from the copulation of creation the Big Bang, if you will. An understanding of the principles will empower one to change their own vibration as well as that of others, if they will devote the time and study necessary to master the art. So I'm sure you can look around and see all sorts of opposites. All right, up and down, here and there, soft and hard. Um, and what the principle is saying that they're really all the same thing. The essence is the same. It's just a different degree. And it gives the example of temperature, hot and cold. That's just temperature. It's the varying um, vibrations of hot and varying um, vibrations of cold. And that um, you change the vibration and you change the temperature. And again, Temperature can be relative, like um, what might feel warm to me. Like, for example, let's say uh, uh, a cold-blooded amphibian. What feels warm to them is what, what, which, what would it be for a human? Really, really cold? A cold blood, uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. But... Um, and like, you know, Sue, Sue is not here today, but Sue always gave, always gave a good example. You, you know when you take a shower in the wintertime versus the summertime? And I do it. In, in the wintertime, I tend to make my water a little hotter. Because, or not, yeah, because that's warmer for me. But the same setting on, on the shower in the summertime is too hot for me. You know, I got to turn it down. But it's the same setting. So in wintertime... The setting feels warmer to me. In the summertime, it feels um, 
um, too warm, right? So I need to turn it down. Um, if you look at your, um, if your mind, the things that your mind goes through, I'm gonna, and I'm going to use, I'm going to use my other nieces as, as an example. I'm going to be nice with her. I'm not going to be. <laughs> so she's going through something right now. Uh, I don't think she'll mind me talking about this. I mean, um, so she's going through. Uh, she's going to be separating or divorcing her husband. And um, in the beginning, she had this attitude towards him. But now things have changed. And now the attitude is move to the other side, right? There's not that love maybe that she had before. I mean, she still cares for him. She still likes him, but there's not that intensity that used to be there, right? It moved to the other side. And um, if we watch ourselves, we see this happening all the time. I mean, I see, I see um, couples falling madly in love, and then a month later, a year later, five years later, they fall madly in hate. <laughs> you guys have seen it. And so we're always, we're always, there's always this swing, you know? And that's just a natural, uh, well, I'm sorry, that I'm, not, I'm getting ahead of myself. There's that swing, but it's, those opposites are always there. We'll be on one side and we'll be on the other side. And really, like love and hate, the same. <clears throat> you can move through the degrees. Love, kind of love, really like, sort of like, um, in the middle, ambivalent, kind of don't like, can't stand, hate the person, right? But they're all the same. And that's just an example there. You can see, um, you can see, the opposites that you have in your mind. You know, one again, one day you're feeling uppity up, and the next day you're feeling pretty depressed. And it's just a position on the scale. And again, if you understand opposition and that, that they're really the same, you can, through psychokinesis, move yourself along that scale, change the vibration, and move yourself to a point um, that you want to be in. The next principle, the principle of rhythm. Everything flows out and in. Everything has its season. All things rise and fall. The pendulum swing expresses itself in everything. The measure of the swing to the right is the measure of the swing to the left. Rhythm compensates. This principle embodies the idea that every, in everything there exists a measured motion to and fro, an outflow and inflow, a swing backward and forward. A pendulum-like movement, a tide-like ebb and flow, a high tide and a low tide. All things come in and out of bond between the two opposing points which exist in accordance with the principle of opposition. Described previously, there is always an action and a reaction, an advance and a retreat, a rising and a sinking. This is in the affairs of the universe, suns, worlds, humankind, animals, mind, energy, and matter. This law is established in the creation and destruction of worlds, in the rise and fall of nations, and finally in the mental states of humans. The students then that realize this principle find its universal application and discover the means to overcome its effect upon themselves. They apply the mental law of neutralization. They cannot annul the principle or cause it to cease its operation. They do not escape the effect of the principle will have on them at one level, but they have learned how to escape its effect upon themselves to a certain degree. They have learned how to use it instead of being used by it. In this and similar methods consists the art of the masters. The masters immerse themselves at the point at which they desire to rest and then neutralize the rhythmic swing of the pendulum which wants to carry them to the opposite point. All individuals who have attained any degree of self-mastery do this naturally more or less unconsciously. But the masters do this consciously by use of their will. They attain a degree of poise and mental firmness beyond belief of the masses who are swung backward and forward on the pendulum of opposition. All the principles of summum have an interrelationship with rhythm. Rhythm draws its nature 
from the copulation of creation. This principle and that of opposition have been closely studied by the masters, and the method of counteracting, neutralizing, and using them forms an important part of psychokinesis. So the principle of rhythm is just that. It's a movement between the opposites, back and forth. Again, you can look around in nature and it's happening all the time. The seasons, the waves in the ocean, the cycles of the, the sun going around uh, on its axis, you know, the planets going around the sun, the sun going around the Milky Way, the Milky Way going around. So it's everywhere and it's in, it's in at grand levels, it's at very small levels, you know, the atoms, you know, subatomic particles. There's a rhythm in everything. And then, you know, it, it says that there's also a rhythm in our mental states and emotions. You, you know, you guys go through it. You go back and forth. And what it also says that um, is that it is possible to, um, you know, like let's say you're in a... a a swing is going towards the bummer mood, let's say. Um, it is possible to, the swing is going to happen, but it is possible to not be so affected by it. And it, again, that comes back to psychokinesis and mental control. The swing still happens, you can't stop rhythm, um, but you can um, sort of jump over the wave and getting, instead of getting smacked by the wave. Okay, number six, the principle of cause and effect. Every cause has its effect. Every effect has its cause. Everything happens according to law. Chance is just a name for law not recognized. There are many fields of causation, but nothing escapes the law of destiny. Some of them. This principle embodies the idea that there is a cause for every effect and an effect from every cause. It explains that everything happens according to law, that nothing ever merely happens, that there is no such thing as chance, that while there are various fields of cause and effect, the higher dominating the lower fields, still nothing ever entirely escapes the law, destiny. The masters understand the art and method of rising above the ordinary field of cause and effect and by mentally rising to a higher field, they become causers instead of effects. The masses of people are carried along obedient to environment. The wills and desires of others stronger themselves than themselves, heredity, suggestion, and other outward causes moving them about like pawns on the chessboard of life. But the masters rising to the field above dominate their moods, character, qualities, and powers as well as the environment surrounding them and become movers instead of pawns. They help to play the game of life instead of being played and moved about by the environment. They use the principles instead of being used. The masters obey the causation of the higher fields, but they help rule, but they help to rule on their own level. All the principles of some of them have an interrelationship with cause and effect. Cause comes in and out of bond with effects. All, effect, all events are between the cause and effect. Cause and effect draws its nature from the copulation of creation. In this statement, there is condensed a wealth of knowledge. So again, you know, it's, cause and effect is all about us. I mean, if you take a look at things, you can see the cause and effect that led to it. Let's take, for example, a, a car accident. You know, we use the term, oh, it was an accident. Have you been, have you, you were in a car accident once, weren't you? Mm -hmm. What happened? We got killed. You got what? Killed. The one that I had with my mom? I can't remember. No, me and my mom were driving, one time were driving on the freeway during that big winter blizzard. Oh, okay, yeah. Was yeah, okay. So... I mean, you know, we, we, we like to use the word accident. It was an accident or an accident happened. But if you really take a look at it, you can see all the things that played in a part with this, right? We have a winter storm. We have people not paying attention to how they're driving. 
distracted, maybe because they're fiddling with the radio or they got to text something or, you know, not in control, you know, they hit the car. What happens? It spins around. There's all this chain of cause and effect that's happened. If you take a look at anything that happens in your life, um, and a lot of times it's, you know, you heard the saying, hindsight is 20, 20. You know, sometimes it has to happen, then we look back and then we can see all the things that happened. Before, it was hard to kind of see these things. But, I mean, as you become more familiar with cause and effect, you, kind of, you can kind of see, you can kind of see, like, things that may be coming down the road, right? Because if you understand how cause and effect works, you kind of see, oh, you know what, this is happening, and I can see this leading to this, and this leading to this, you know what, I think I'm going to not be around when that happens. You know, it's kind of interesting with the politics going on today. The stuff that's going on, I'm just kind of watching this. I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to watch the cause and effect here. Let's see, let's see how this plays out. You know, and, and you can see all this stuff, you know. I mean, I don't know exactly how it's all going to pan out, but I can see how it's related and how these things are happening. And, you know, like the, the, the Wall Street is all excited now because of all these tariffs and everything and, you know, all this uncertainty going on. But, but it's all following cause and effect. It's really interesting to watch. And the more you become familiar with cause and effect, you, you, you may look at situations and decide, you know what, I'm going to kind of move out of that situation because I don't want to get into that train that's going on over there. But um, anyway, cause and effect is an interesting thing. Just watch the world. Watch the world, but, and then watch yourself. The things that you go through, the cause and effect that happens with you. All right, the last principle. I'm sorry, we're going a little bit over an hour today, but we're on the last principle. The principle of gender. Gender isn't everything. Everything has its masculine and feminine principles. Gender manifests on all levels, some of them. This principle embodies the idea that there is gender expressed in everything. The masculine and feminine principles ever at work. The nature of the copulation of creation displays in this principle. This is a fact not only of the physical level, but of the mental and even the spiritual levels. On the physical levels, the principle presents itself as sex. On the higher levels, it takes higher forms. But the principle is ever the same. No creation, physical, mental, or spiritual, is possible without this principle. An understanding of its laws will throw light on many a subject that has perplexed the minds of humans. The principle of gender works ever in the direction of generation, regeneration, and creation. Everything and every person contains the two elements or aspects of this great principle within it, him or her. Every male has the female element as well. Every female contains also the male principle. If you are to understand the philosophy of mental and spiritual creation, generation, and regeneration, you must understand and study this principle. All the principles of summum have an interrelationship with, gen with gender. As the nothing comes in and the possibility out of bond, gender is created. Gender draws its nature from the copulation of creation. It contains the solution to many mysteries of life. So basically what the principle of gender is saying is there is a masculine aspect and a, and a feminine aspect that exist within everything and that these t whenever a something is created it is a result of these two aspects coming together. You know, at a physical level it's, you know, uh, uh, when a baby is born, the male and the female join, and, and uh, you know, the creation comes about of the baby. But if you take a look at even um, anything you do, anything you create, let's say art, within you a, um, a masculine and a feminine energy are coming together, and you create this art. 
um, if you'll look at it closely. And just sort of watch, watch things when they're created. See if you can spot them, you know, a masculine force, uh, a feminine force coming together to bring the, that into existence, to bring that creation about. And another important thing that the principle says is that both within each of us, both aspects are there. Mm -hmm. Within the male is the female, and within the female is the male. And if you can recognize that um, and bring those two aspects together, then um, you've joined together your whole being. And you, you become whole, right? And so that's an experience. But again, that takes mental work. All this stuff involves the mind. Back to the principle of psychokinesis, the essence of everything is mind. So the more you can take the time to kind of take a look at your mind, um, the more interesting life becomes. So anyway... Great. Those are the seven principles. We'll leave it there. If you want to read more about it, like I said, the book is online. You can download it. Um, and go through the website. There's a lot of stuff on the website. Good stuff on the website. So we're just going to close by ringing the bell again.